Welcome to this video lecture. This is Mark Scythian, FAA licensed aerospace technician, airframe, power plant, and avionics certified. The date today is July 31st, 2016. And this video lecture will cover airplane flight control surfaces and high lift devices. The airplane being a three-dimensional air vehicle is controlled and steered by the equilibrium of three different axes in accordance to coordinated turns. So representing the pitch axis is the elevator, the roll axis, the ailerons, the yaw or directional axis, the rudder, then comes flaps which is not considered a high lift device because the flaps increase both the coefficient of lift and the coefficient of drag simultaneously so they're ideal for landing and takeoff procedures next comes the spoilers the spoilers can be used for descent roll assistance and landing speed brakes since they can equally or differentially dump some of the lift on either or wing assisting in landing and slow speed flight maneuvers especially with swept wings. Swept wings do not like to fly very well at low speeds so high lift devices, flaps, and spoilers can take the place of the descent and roll functions on such planforms. Next are the servo and anti-servo tabs these are usually used in non-hydraulic applications for amplifying or reducing the amount of force applied to a flight control surface for ergonomics. The actual airplane high lift devices to focus on are the slats. These allow a higher wing angle without the risk of stall since the slats are on the leading edge of the wing at the wing angle that exceeds the critical limit, the airflow can then be redirected to the top of the wing without spilling off the surface. Uh, next are the vortex generators. These are fins that are installed so that they make divergent channel ducts and what they do is they increase the airflow and the eddy current vortices on the top of the wing being so lightweight and causing that much airflow and vortices increase, they actually are very efficient high lift devices. It's just that one should make the, make the decision if they want to implement VGs when dealing with drag sensitive applications. Uh, lastly are winglets and wing fences. Though winglets are separating high and low pressure at the wingtips, they also direct wake turbulence that spills off the wingtip lower surface and redirects them into thrust. So technically since the high speed airflow at the top of the wing is fenced off, they are considered high lift devices because at the tip of a wing the most lift distribution is taking place, therefore the stall speed is reduced slightly with the winglets, so it does classify itself as a high lift device. So those terminologies will then be explained here with these graphics. Uh, graphic number one here, we have an airliner and the pitch axis is controlled by the elevators which are on the horizontal stabilizer on the rear of the plane. This is a conventional empennage. So when the control yoke is moved back, the elevators will come up, causing a force downward on the tail, causing the nose to go up, thus increasing the angle of attack on the wing, increasing climb and wing lift. The opposite is true if the elevators were positioned downward. Next we have the ailerons, which are differential deflection 
per wing. So you see here that this airplane is making a right roll, so that means the outboard aileron on the right side of the wing is going to be up and the left wing is going to be down. So this causes a differential in wing lift inducing a roll. However, ailerons need a good horizontal stabilizer because when the initial roll is inputted into the controls there is going to be a wing twist but since the stabilization of the pitch axis is kept within equilibrium, the wing twist is then distributed back to the structure. And now a roll can be induced without having the additional torsion stresses added to the wing. So we cover the pitch axis, then the roll axis, and the last axis is the directional or yaw axis, which is controlled by the rudder. And here we have a left input rudder function taking place. And as you can see, the vertical stabilizer is going to inherently stabilize the directional control. But when the deflection of the rudder is made to the left, it's going to cause a force to the tail to the right, causing the nose to move to the left. So this is just like a boat rudder, except you're using the fluid of air, not the fluid of water. So now when you coordinate all three axes on a fixed wing airplane, let's say the pilot intends to make a left turn that's coordinated, you must cancel out all of the slip and skid imbalances that happen on the turn so that the G's are maintained at 1.0 on all three axes. If not, then the passengers are not going to really like the ride because they're either going to weigh more or less on an uncoordinated turn. So the pilot, of course, if he was going to make a left turn here, he would input a little bit of elevator for climb, then he would roll left, and then he would step on the left pedal to coordinate it. When all three are balanced, there is very little slip and skid, and then it's a nice smooth coordinated turn without uh, excessive positive or negative G's on three axes. So that's what pilots train to do is to coordinate their axes in accordance to the slip and skid on turns and then the passengers have a nice smooth ride during the flight. Although today avionics is very dominant on heavy airliners and digital accelerometers and gyros pretty much measure the slip and skid and coordinate the turns usually by GPS. However, it is requirement to manually fly a swept wing and understand how to coordinate the slip and skid axes in accordance with stabilizing G-forces and as well as knowing how to uh, stabilize the critical angles on the wings. However, a lot of that is not even being used anymore due to auto flight and avionics systems. As a maintenance technician, you will have to take those inputs and then have the mechanical, electrical, and structural translation go back into the specifications. Then you can make the diagnosis and the sign-offs, but it's very important to know that what happens physically can be mapped out electrically and thus going to software. So when you go to do the overnight checks, you will be able to take the flight records and match them to the hydraulics, the electrical, the structural, and then of course the power requirements are calibrated to the engines and then to the software. So it's all in the maintenance manual specifications, but how that works, this is the basic overview. So next we move on to uh, of course a conventional airplane here uh, same concept except see you're not using the jet here you're using the propeller so let's say this propeller was rotating counterclockwise and it was going to make a climb well then there's gyroscopic precession and of course it would be like tipping a gyroscope backwards if it was on a vertical plane so you're going to get a moment to the left or a yaw to the left so of course the pilot 
on GA training would know to give a little right rudder as he climbs. However, uh, many airplane designers will put a, an inherent offset on the vertical stabilizer called P-factor to compensate for that. This makes uh, pilot ergonomics optimal, but remember that when you put an input in, especially with a rotating disc, you got to compensate for that precession. On uh, different video lectures, I will cover uh, the applied physics of rigidness in space, gyroscopic precession, and counter torque. But just to stay on point, uh, I put this graphic in because if you're dealing with propellers, it's a little different on how you coordinate the, the roll. Uh, the precession has to be canceled out. But, of course, the jets today are ducted, uh, propeller fans run by a gas turbine, and there is some precession, but very negligible, because look at the size of the wings, they're so huge, so uh, something called a yaw dampener is pretty much implemented, and you really don't have to worry about that. It made, actually, the large planes easier to work on, because the, t the time is very critical, and smaller planes like smaller, older cars, you know, it takes a little more skill, but uh, the concept is similar. Uh, next here. Next we have wing spoilers, and like I said, they can be used equally or differentially to dump some of the lift on either or wing. These come in very uh, ideally during a high altitude control descent. You might be 90 miles from the airport, but you're still at 36,000 feet. You'll have a 700,000 pound aircraft flying at 550, 560, and you have to come down to 12,000 feet in under six minutes without upsetting the passengers. So uh, nowadays it's computer controlled, controlled descent, but the idea is, is to kill some of that lift on the wing upper surface by dumping it with a spoiler, but you're not changing your attitude. You have a level plane with a smooth acceleration downward and then a constant speed, so no more G's. It's back to 1.0 G's, but you're losing 8,000 feet per minute and nobody in the cabin even knows it. So the spoilers do that uh, controlled descent. That's why they call it a controlled descent. And nowadays, uh, the liability behind doing something like that is pretty much resigned to computer controlled engagement. So uh, on the maintenance level, you know, you have to make sure that the incremental electrohydraulic actuations are within the timing phase. There's a timing phase that goes on, and so these will open up slowly, and then they'll be matched to uh, certified acceleration downward, and then they'll go full. So you probably have about 90% of the lift of the plane. And uh, anyway, the idea is the uh, uh, to limit that acceleration. You don't want that acceleration to be uh, too excessive because then people are going to be kind of weightless as they're going down. They don't want to, they wanted a, ro a roller coaster ride, they'd go to Cedar Point. You know, a lot of people don't like that. So uh, the law says, the FAA says that you can't exceed more than 0.3 to 0.5 G's negative uh, because of flight physiology and no one's going to fly in your plane anymore. So if you have to lose that much altitude that fast, uh, there is a standard that's in the maintenance. That's what the maintenance technician does on the airplane. So once that is uh, calibrated and maintained, uh, the pilot can uh, just implement that into the GPS auto flight, and then he makes a nice, smooth, controlled descent, 8,000 feet per minute, and nobody knows that's happening. That's the idea. So... Spoilers on descent are very optimal on the initial landing procedures because you have to not only get your altitude down but also your speed. And then your, of course, you can. There is some speed break effects on the spoilers different uh, when operated equally. And then, uh, of course, the inboard spoilers will start to become roll spoilers when the plane is going to slower speeds. The slotted flaps will come out. And, uh, of course, they increase lift and drag. So a lot of things are going on, but the idea is to get the speed down. This is a beast, 700,000-pound beast flying at 550 miles per hour, and you have to get your speed down to about 220, 230, 
And then uh, you don't want too much deflection of the ailerons on the outboard side of the wing because, you know, it's a swept wing and they don't like to fly at low speed. So uh, deflection is minimized and, of course, the avionics senses the dynamic pressure and locks those out. So you'll see on the final landing the spoilers are assisting uh, basically a mid-board aileron on, on the Boeings and uh, that keeps the air on the wing with the least amount of deflection just a little bit of uh, differential lift using spoilers so they call that roll spoilers uh, and also the wing tips are very critical on um, the swept wing your wing tips are where a majority of your lift comes from but look at the cord it's so much lower than it is at the root and so if you exceed the critical angle on such a small cord uh, you can have a wingtip stall and then a sudden spin into a crash so they'll always twist that wingtip negative on the twist of the wing and uh, that's called a washout and uh, so you don't see much going on with that outboard aileron it's all just uh, differential spoiler inputs and then you know a lot of gusts of wind and all these things happen so you have to like under uh, dump some of the lift on the wings so you don't have a, a imbalance in the in the roll stabilization and you'll see that on the wing so the next graphic here so basically the spoilers have equal lift dumping differential lift dumping and then of course on landing they can go full deployment to speed brakes and like uh, when you land you don't you can't use the brakes you have to kill the wing lift, turn it into a land vehicle, put the nose down, and then go ahead with thrust reversers. These small wheels don't like brakes at such a high uh, momentum, mass times velocity. So you got to get the speed down before you really can use the brakes. But in the aviation world, the cardinal rules don't ever use your brakes because until you get to a slower enough speed, you let the uh, aerodynamic braking work. So spoilers do a lot of things. And it's very important to understand they're not just killing the lift. They also can be used for uh, steering, and differential uh, roll in place of ailerons. So easiest way to understand this is just look at the pictures here. So you have a controlled descent happening on an Airbus here. And both wings, of course, have their outboard spoilers deployed at uh, whatever the computers detect the glide slope to be. We have uh, roll spoilers here assisting the aileron. This one's a Boeing here. Looks like a 3.7. And so, you know, this is trimming the, the wing roll at the final landing procedure here. It's got its flaps out. And so, so we'll stop at flaps and slats and go to part two of this video lecture. I'll see you in the next video.